Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar series, How to Make a Bid No Bid Decision. This is the first webinar in our three-part series this week. My name is Chloe Norwood, and I'm the Field Marketing Specialist at Visible Thread. I'm thrilled to welcome our part one speaker, Ton Wilson, President of Intellect. The second and third part of How to Make a Bid No Bid Decision series will continue tomorrow at 11 a.m. with Fred Vilcek, Senior Proposal Manager at Khaki, and Thursday at 11 a.m. with Kyle Peterson, Vice President of Customer Success at Visible Thread. Before we begin, I'd like to note that in the related free content box on your screen, there are some assets you may find useful. Feel free to submit any questions you may have into the Q&A box, and the slides and recording of this webinar will be available after it ends. And now I will hand it over to Ton. Great. Thanks so much, Chloe, for the introduction, and welcome, everyone. Um, to the first part. I love being the first to everything, so kicking this off is um, is going to be a lot of fun. What we're going to do here today, um, here I guess I should probably, I always like to dive straight into like the details of everything, so I apologize. Um, a little bit about myself for those of you who are not familiar with me. Um, my name is Ton Wilson and I'm the president of Intellect and the host of Ton's Two Cents. Um, I'm looking at the attendees list and so many of you are so familiar. Um, it's nice to be able to speak to a lot of uh, colleagues who I've worked with in, in the previous years. So I've got over 25 years of experience here in, in GovCon. Um, and what we do here at Intellect is we do uh, business strategy, uh, capture management, proposal development, um, price to win and executive coaching. Um, that's kind of us in, in a nutshell, but I highly recommend that everybody follow us on LinkedIn um, as you can never know what to expect, um, which is the reason why I started my podcast is Tons Two Cents. It's actually not really kind of a, it's a podcast of sorts, but it's more of a master's class in GovCon where we take an hour and we dive into a specific topic and really give it the attention that it really needs. So which makes today's session so difficult to create and come up with how do you take such an incredibly um, difficult topic um, and fit it all into a 45 minute time frame and allow time for questions from everybody. So I think I've tried to do it the best I can, knowing that many of you are coming from different levels of experience. Um, some of you may have a lot of knowledge of the process or leading the actual organization um, department for your own organizations for how to do bid decisions. Um, and But others of you may be new to the process. So I always like to kind of level set expectations and to create kind of a baseline so that we're all um, starting from the same point. So I'll do a little bit of that too, but I'll glass over some of that and really kind of get into the meat of what are some of the external and internal factors that kind of influence our decision-making process um, and how can we um, develop and build confidence over the course of um, this experience to really understand and be able to bid competitively um, in this field. So hopefully this will be interesting for everybody from regardless of where you are. Um, I think there's, uh, is there any technical issue from your side? Um, Chloe, if you wanna just double check to see that everybody is um, broadcasting clearly, I think uh, we should be good. Uh, if you could just maybe leave a message. Okay, great, we're good. So um, as far as the BD life cycle, I always like to start off with this slide because it gives us a, a good foundation of where we're gonna talk today. Where we're gonna speak is in the pre-bid phase um, where we're looking at how do you make bid decisions? That's not to say that you don't continue to make bid decisions or have additional gate reviews after the opportunity is released after the draft, because you're gonna to wanna to review that and, and make another decision like after the uh, final solicitation is released because things may have changed. Um, your company organizational situation may have changed, your teaming construct may have changed, the entire opportunity from draft to final might have changed. And so don't feel like you have to uh, feel like once we made a bid decision, you can't go back or you can't make that change. You do need to you know, consider all factors um, before moving forward. 
So why is a bid no bid process important? Well, it's important for a number of different reasons, but before we go into why it's important and why a formal and documented process is important, let's kind of like define and make sure that we understand what a bid process is. And I know in industry, we like to turn like for around a lot of acronyms. We like to say that we use the Shipley approach and yada, yada, whatever, or maybe your own organization has one too. Um, but I like to keep it a little bit more general in that it's just a systemic evaluation process that you use to determine whether or not you're going to pursue or not pursue an opportunity. And how that looks for your organization may look very differently than your competitors or may look differently than how Khaki does it or how Lidos does it. And so they all kind of take a similar process, a foundation, and modify it to that organization. And you need to modify that obviously too, to the size of the opportunity because you're not gonna go through a full blown, you know, 10 or 12 gate review for a task or a bid or, you know, or a smaller effort. Um, and so you really do need to understand um, how to kind of tailor that for your need and for that opportunity's need. But why is it important? Obviously, the bottom line is so that you can win. So you can make an informed decision to win that opportunity. Um, me, I like to, you know, uh, always emphasize the importance of focusing. There's a lot of distractions in our industry. There's a lot of opportunities that you could always bid. And so having a formalized process, something that is objective, something that is repeatable, helps you kind of maintain focus to make sure that the opportunities are aligned to what your business strategy is, what your organizational mission and goals are. Um, so focus is really important. Um, clarity, obviously, too, you know, like understanding, you know, it, do you have a clear understanding of the opportunity and, and how it aligns with your goals and priorities? Um, obviously, uh, we here at Intellect and their processes. Um, I'm a process person, I'm a PMP, and so I think very process-like. And so having a repeatable process, regardless of who it is who's facilitating that process, it should operate in a similar manner or the same manner each time. There should be very few variabilities, variables in that um, as it goes from one person to one person or one organization or like one department within your own organization too. Um, and accountability, that I think that is really important, especially when you're working with consultants and you're working with an outside source who's helping you make some of these decisions or they're finding you opportunities for you to evaluate. Um, I don't think we hold our people accountable enough sometimes. Um, there's always a reason why something, you know, like fell through or we couldn't do something. Um, but, you know, having a clear process really kind of holds everybody to, to be accountable, to make sure that they are doing their due diligence and that you do make sure that you have um, a really clear understanding of what the opportunity is. Um, and obviously risk. There's risk to everything. And, and I, would, I would say this too, is that there's a risk to bidding and there's a risk to not bid. I um, mean, we kind of talk a little bit more about that um, when we talk about the external influencers and, and what your customer is expecting um, or if they're not expecting you to, um, to bid an opportunity. Um, transparency, I think, is really important from um, a C-suite executive level. You know, you really need to understand um, and, and see in um, how, uh, how opportunities are, um, what decisions are, so that everyone in your organization understands that from your line managers to your PMs to your boots on the ground people, um, you know, you shouldn't have a bid decision process that is something that is protected or isolated or, you know, like, oh, it's, a, it's cloaked in mystery um, that no one seems to understand or, or realize how is it that, um, you know, that we are um, making this bid decision. Um, where I get involved a lot is um, from a scalability perspective. Um, I find that uh, companies really uh, bid too many opportunities. Um, and we'll talk about some of the FOMO um, reasons for bidding and why companies bid too many opportunities or bid the wrong opportunities. I mean, it all stems back to your bid decision as to whether or not, um, you know, you want to do that. But from scalability, not only from a resources to respond to an opportunity, 
um, is important, but do you have the resources to also execute um, and, and make sure that you can meet the customer's expectations, that you have the staffing, that you have the infrastructure, that you have the capital and the financing in order to be able to successfully um, execute on contracts. So that's, you know, that's also something that you need to consider. Um, and to um, also here, I don't want to like belabor the slide, but there's a whole slew of other reasons here that we'll kind of, you know, dive into. The process itself, and I intentionally left this slide without the um, the terms that we like to use in GovCon a lot, um, which is BD, capture proposals. Yes, I have proposals in here, whatever, but I didn't talk about BD or capture because it means different things to different people. Depending upon the size of your company, sometimes that BD capture person is the same person. Sometimes those activities are kind of lumped in together. Sometimes you're just not big enough to have a full on capture. And that's okay if that's the type of opportunities that you're bidding on. But I think you need to understand the overall process of you know, opportunity identification is obviously the first phase or phase zero or one, however you want to number it or color it or whatever. Um, that's really when you're sourcing and looking at potential opportunities. Qualifying is the stage where the majority of what we're going to be talking about today kind of falls into. Is that's really where you're kind of determining um, the whether or not the opportunity is suitable for you know your organization. Um, you know, understanding how the opportunity or the proposal is going to be evaluated. What is the customer's requirements? What does the budget look like? Not only your budget internally for bidding this, but what is the customer's budget? You know, is is there is there funding behind that? Um, timeline wise, that's really important too, is like the timing of when these opportunities are gonna be released, the timing of when the um, contract is going to be executed. Um, there's a whole slew of things that are both internal and external facing, and I'll spend more time on that here later too, but really kind of also making sure that you understand the risks, the rewards, and what are some of the um, some of the um, strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and threats that is that exist with that opportunity. And do you understand and know from a competitive landscape perspective, you know who your competitors are, um, who are you know should you team with those competitors? Should you you know try like how are you going to mitigate um, your proposal risk? How are you? What is your bid strategy to make sure that your proposal is as strong as that it can be? Um, and so that's that's really kind of important for you to flush out during these phases, so that when you hand off to proposals, they're not left wondering, well, how am I supposed to bid that? They can tell you what is required, what is going to be evaluated, but it's really kind of critical to make sure that that handoff from BD capture or that qualification stage goes smoothly and that it makes it to the next phase, which is the proposal development process. And we'll talk about that in our part two of this series. So um, hopefully this will give you a lot of uh, background information so that you can kind of go into the next segment um, of this series with a really good understanding of what to do next. Internal and external influences. Um, there's two slides on this and I kind of spent a lot of time on this because I think it's really important to understand that there's a lot to go behind making some of these bid decisions. That it's not, should we beat this opportunity because we have proposal resources or we have time or we've got, oh, we've got 21 days until it's due, we should definitely do that. Um, no, it's a little bit more sophisticated than than those three different things that I just mentioned. Um, internal factors, FOMO. I find that the majority of the reasons why people bid too many opportunities or bid the wrong opportunities and tend to lose them is because they have the fear of missing out. Um, trust me, FOMO is strong in this industry and that's not a reason to do that, but it is a really valid concern, obviously for these larger contracting vehicles that are 10, five years out, you don't wanna get shut out. Some of these opportunities do have an on-ramp and you can get on at a later date. Um, but really kind of critically think, you know, from an, from an organizational perspective, what does it look like if you don't get on that vehicle um, from a business perspective? Is it going to really impact your business? Are there is future work coming out with your customers that's going to go out on those vehicles that you may want to kind of critically look at that? And then, you know, is it aligned then with where your core business cap and, and your capabilities are? So all of that kind of goes into the decision-making process. Um, 
uh, authenticity over um, versus over promising. That's really hard for small businesses, um, especially those who are new to to um, GovCon to be able to kind of prove themselves. Maybe you don't have a contract yet, or maybe you haven't broken into an um, agency and you want to kind of stretch your, op you know, stretch your capabilities. Um, really kind of take a cold, hard look. Are you overstretching? Are you overpromising? Because that can really have a, you know, a pretty negative impact too. You get in there and you can't perform. The worst thing to do would be um, to, you know, not have an option year, to default, to, um, you know, incur additional costs because you didn't understand how to price the opportunity because you didn't understand the work that was in place. So really kind of taking a cold hard look at the requirements and, and saying, you know, can you, uh, you know, can you realistically perform this work um, vices, you know, is this something that you're kind of maybe stretching? Stretching is good. I think stretching, you know, to some extent can be really good, um, but stretching too much can also be, you know, um, a, a really bad uh, bad thing too. Um, at the end of the day, um, sales pressures. Um, I love BD people because they're all sunshine, purple unicorns, rainbows. They see the opportunities everywhere. I think that's really, really good when you kind of balance that out with, um, you know, uh, the um, oh, the sky's falling. We can't do that. It's too expensive. You know, whatever it is that a lot of times your line managers or your boots on the ground people will kind of throw roadblocks when you, you know, why they can't do something. Um, you really do need to kind of find a balance between that, right? You, you do need new work. You do need to have work that's kind of growing your capabilities or growing your staff. Um, but again, all goes back to, is it aligned with your business um, growth strategies, right? Some companies, they just want to sustain. That's okay. Other companies want to grow, 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 sell. Um, and so your approach to how you determine what to bid on and, and which opportunities are aligned with your um, with your growth strategies is going to be very different um, from you know one, one company to the next. So really kind of understanding that. Um, the other thing, I guess, um, is profitability and performance. And I think I kind of touched on that a little bit too, um, is, is that, you know, it, can you do this, can you execute this contract? Can you, you know, if you win this contract, can you do it profitably? Um, and I think that's really kind of important and that's part of your bid strategy that kind of goes into that. External influences, um, there's so many different factors on this and I'll let you kind of read the slides um, yourself. But um, I, I think the the thing that um, is the easiest for everyone to always you know answer is the relationship and the past performance with the customer. Um, that's something that you can answer fairly easily. I think some of the other things that are a little bit more difficult to answer would be the reputation versus perception, right? You know, it's like, um, how is this going to impact your company if you don't bid? Um, or if you do bid, maybe it could be a game changer for your company um, to bid an opportunity. Um, maybe it's something that you've got market presence and you have to do this. You have to bid. You have, you know, everyone's expecting you to. Um, so what is it that you need to do to make sure that you're as competitive as you can be and that you're delivering a quality product and proposal um, at the end of the day? Um, the, uh, you know, the same thing with like market expansion competitive strategy, you know, the, there are reasons for you to bid new opportunities that are outside of maybe where you're comfortable in. Um, and so you can kind of see here is that, you know, the external um, influences really have to, you know, do with the external perceptions and some customers are expecting you to. Um, so, you know, if you've got a customer, a lot of us have, you know, really good relationships with customers are like, hey, something's coming up. We want you to bid on it. You know, it, it could look bad if you don't bid on it. So, you know, but what do you need to do to make sure that, um, you know, if you submit a bid, that you are submitting the strongest bid that you can possibly submit? Um, and then strategic partnerships and collaborations. That's, I, I, I spend a lot of time with customers on that. Um, there's very few opportunities anymore where companies are bidding by themselves or bidding alone. Um, the contracts are so much larger, uh, customers going back to bundling to larger efforts. I mean, they're highly encouraging um, teaming. And, and so, you know, um, that really kind of impacts you too. You know, do you have a teaming partner who's bringing you this opportunity? Um, 
to maybe you know break into a customer or a market sector that you don't currently have. Um, so that's always a, a an influencer into whether or not you should bid an opportunity. Um, Chloe, I'm going to let you go ahead and kind of continue to monitor the um, the questions, and I'll kind of take questions along the way if they kind of come up. Um, I think we're doing really good. Um, otherwise, I'll kind of pause towards the end here for for questions. Um, so insights and strategies. Um, the I think it's really important for us to you know I'm. Uh, the whole premise behind my podcast, Hans Two Senses, um, Unfiltered Strategies for Real World Success is kind of our tag. And so I don't think we spend enough time on the strategic discussions and considerations for opportunities where we're so tactical. You know, it's like we talk about the gate reviews, we talk about this process and stuff like that, and we kind of lose sight as to like, you know, why is it that we're bidding an opportunity? What is it, you know, is it in our best interest to kind of do that? So. Um, let's talk a little bit about some insights and strategies and understanding the opportunity. Um, it, it's really important to really kind of um, have someone who is able to understand the customer, understand the opportunity, and really kind of digest, you know, what what is it that we're bidding on? Um, it, there's a whole lot more than can we do the work? Do we have the past performances? It's can we meet the submission requirements? And if you're bidding an opportunity, that is, you know, in its second or third, you know, iteration, then there's draft solicitation that you can go back on and review and analyze. And so I think that's really kind of helpful, but a lot of times you kind of have to read between the tea leaves and maybe you have to look at, um, you know, for this contracting officer or this office, there was a similar opportunity that was released last year or six months ago that may look similar to it. So you kind of understand what the customer's looking for from a response perspective um, and what some of the, you know, um, procedural type of uh, response uh, elements are, are going to be. Um, the other thing that you need to kind of consider too is, you um, the opportunity assessments, right? Like do your market analysis, understand the customer, analyze your customer, who are the competitive, um, you know, your competitors who are gonna be going, you know, after that, what are their capabilities? You know, how can you mitigate or throw shade on them, you know? Um, so, so really kind of do those capture activities um, um, throughout this process to make sure that you kind of understand the opportunity and those who are currently already operating in that space. The um, the tools and methodology, uh, I, I know that many of you, and if you don't have one now, I highly recommend that you go find one, create one, make one, borrow one, um, would be um, a bid checklist. Um, there are a lot of platforms and products out there who have a bid checklist. Um, Next Stage is my platform of choice. They have a checklist. I believe GovWin does to GovTribe. Everybody's got their own bid decision checklist that could either be tailored or used out of the box. Um, you can use a um, an Excel spreadsheet and score them based on you know like numerical one to five ranking and things like that. Anything that you can objectively evaluate an opportunity and quickly do that is always kind of helpful because we're again back to the FOMO and making you know like emotional decisions we tend to bid from a very emotional place and so when you have um, a clear objective process or a checklist or some type of an evaluation tool um, that has preset questions that are consistently asked each time it allows you to make decisions in a more objective kind of way instead of you know failing oh you know like the customer loves us or um, we're a veteran-owned company so we should do work with the VA but you haven't really clearly understood what is it that the VA is buying or can you meet the requirements in this opportunity um, and so I, I highly recommend that you spend some time and, and thoughts into what is the best um, tool to use um, in order to be able to evaluate consistently across the board. Um, risk and mitigation, I, I think that's something that we don't spend a whole lot of time on. I don't think that we think, you know, like what's the risk if we do bid on this? What is the risk if we don't? Um, and so there's, there's a lot of things that you can do um, during the evaluation process to, you know, um, to consider that because those are most likely going to be similar risks that you're going to have to address in the response. Um, there's there's risk to every contract. There's risk to every opportunity, um, and so really kind of spend some time, you know, thinking through um, through that. Um, 
the let's see i'm just trying to think i think there's other things that we can probably spend better time on um but the the other really good thing it, you know being a process person is um when you have a process that everybody understands and is using um, realize too that it can always be improved. You should always kind of learn every engagement I'm learning. I look at my you know, bid process decision um, from when I first started my company, Vices, where it is now, and it has grown leaps and bounds. Um, tools, technology, um, the, the maturity of the organization, um, everything kind of impacts your, your process and you should kind of continually in, um, encourage um, feedback and improvements. And so um, I, I don't ever look at, you know, um, a situation where we've got chaos or if something bad happens or, you know, things can go quite our way as a setback. It To me, it's to, a, an opportunity to um, kind of improve or learn um, or better understand, um, you know, where we can improve next time, what have we learned and, and maybe kind of hedge those, uh, you know, those, those issues uh, the next time around. So hopefully through this whole process, you've gotten a little bit more confident, um, you know, in your ability to make the bid decision more consistently, make consistent business decisions, um, make objective business decisions. Um, and so you should be bidding more confidently. What I really love when I come in and the customer is like, we have no idea what we're bidding. We're everywhere. We're kind of scattered. At the end of our engagement, they're like, you know, they feel so empowered that they're like, oh my God, you know, making just small little changes, whether it's a checklist or changing how you run your gate reviews or how you run your business development, um, you know, opportunity uh, decision uh, meetings, um, just slight, small tweaks and, and incorporations of little key elements, I think can make really large impactful um, um, changes and improvements in the process. And so, uh, you know, what are what are ways that you can be more confident um is really kind of clearly assess your capabilities take a really cold hard look of what you're capable of right what are your core capabilities what are your ancillary capabilities what are your stretches um and, and kind of put them into like buckets and really kind of evaluate your expertise um, some organizations are really good doing certain things, but it's not profitable, right? So if you can't do something profitable or if you don't do something well, then maybe you shouldn't focus on opportunities that are, you know, um, maybe what you started your business with. And so companies evolve. So maybe your first contract was doing whatever, and now you've grown and you're you have more experience and you have better past performance in a different business area. And maybe you focus more of your opportunities in that area. So really kind of take a hard look and, and keep your past performances up to date, your capabilities, your resources, and your people. Um, knowledge management and the management and, uh, and, and identification of the qualifications of your staff, I think is so key and it's lost half the time. Um, you know, they, they, don't keep very good records of um, uh, employees and staff's certifications, um, maybe customers that they have had experience in or um, opportunities that they may have worked on in the past. Those are places where you should be mining um, and identifying new opportunities. And so, you know, you, your people are a great resource. Um, they're your knowledge base. And so, you know, I, I would say just as important as it is to maintain and, and properly, you know, like assess your capabilities from a past performance perspective, definitely so from a resourcing and staffing perspective. I think that's 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 a critical thing that I think sometimes we get easily overlooked. Um, optimizing your business strategy, you know, your, your business strategy for one customer, one opportunity is gonna be very different than the next one. And so being able to kind of tailor that, a lot of times I see like this one right size fits all type of approach. Um, and they have the same discriminators and differentiators for every opportunity and, and you can't. Um, every customer is different. Every opportunity is different. And while the uh, while they maybe the the services or the products are are, are the same or, or similar, they're they're going to be different under different set of needs under different programs. And so, you know, really understanding and, and learning how to kind of tailor that will really make going into the parole process, uh, you know, stronger. And um, you're you're going to be more confident and be going in, into uh, a new bid decision. 
and preparing. Um, you know, at Intellect, our, our tag is plan, prepare, and expect to win. I don't think that you can plan enough. That, and that's not to say that, you know, all my plans go exactly how um, I originally, you know, thought that they would go, but at least I had a plan. At least I was kind of prepared for um, some potential unknowns. I've, I've tried to identify potential risk and risk mitigation, um, you know, approaches to, you know, what happens if, you know, we don't have the right key staff or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but really kind of plan the approach, plan how you're going to, you know, go through the process, um, plan your resources, plan your, you know, teaming partners, um, key personnel, your staffing and things like that. There's nothing worse than having a proposal or a solicitation hit and you're starting a proposal and they have no idea what past performances they're going to use. They have no idea who the key personnel are going to be, um, you know. How do you know if you're going to be able to confidently or, you know, be able to bid competitively on that if you hadn't already thought that through or planned that out? Um, and, and so, you know, really, you know, you're much more confident if you plan ahead of time your resources and your references and um, and your approach, too. Um, I, I'm... I'm, I don't know why that I'm ever surprised that uh, when I get into a proposal and no one has thought out how they're going to manage the um, response, they're like, oh, you know, we've got the management plan already written. And the management plan is always the hardest one. The org chart is, too. It's like, how, how do you not have this already laid out? Um, and so, you know, that's that's part of the planning process. Um, that should already kind of be baked out and, and developed and mapped out. Um, Communication and collaboration. I, I think that this is really difficult. I think everyone likes to think that they're really good communicators and that they're great collaborators and they've got all these great tools and you know things like that to you know communicate and collaborate. Um, but I think this goes a little deeper than just the technology of it. It goes into how do we do that? How do we communicate with our stakeholders, with our customers? Have you communicated with your customers beforehand? Um, have you continued to communicate with your stakeholders? Um, and stakeholders could be, you know, your customers and your teaming partners too. Um, you know, I don't think that we're ever going to come in a situation where teaming partners don't pull out the last minute, you know, when a solicitation is released or, um, you know, teaming goes exactly how you thought it would go. Uh, but uh, again, you know, having very transparent and consistent and frequent communications with not only your teaming partners is important, but also within your own organizations. Um, I know that when we, we recently had an engagement here at Intellect where we came in and we were uh, evaluating the processes. And one of the companies says that I think we need to do a better job of um, letting our staff know when they're going to be bid as a key person um, because they don't know until they see their resumes during a color team review that they're being bid. It's like, how do you not tell your staff that they're going to be bid as a key person? Um, to me, that's that's insane. Um, but you know, you need to communicate internally, not a, well, not only within the BD proposal. Um, organization, but within the line managers, within the boots on the ground, within the people who are actually doing the work. Um, and so it seems kind of like an obvious thing for me to say, but communications down and within the organization um, tends to kind of break down when, uh, you know, when we're in proposal mode and we kind of keep everything in the proposal team and we don't talk outside. So um, that's kind of really important. And again, continuous process improvement and learning. Um, it's hard, I get it, but you can't um, you can't refine, build a will oil machine or continue to you know be more confident in your approach if you don't continually ask for and submit feedback. Um, and sometimes it's just not the feedback that you want. And so I get it, you know, capturing proposal people, you know, we get it from all ends, we're getting it all the time, you know, uh, we get all the blame, none of the glory. Um, and so sometimes it can be really kind of a thankless job, but we really do kind of have to suck it up sometime and, and, and ask and elicit, you know, feedback so that we can improve and, and realize that the feedback and the improvements will help you. Um, it will help you run a better um, process. It will help you be more effective. Um, and, and, and really um, what I find too is that a lot of times the C-suite and the executives don't realize that this is a chronic problem. I don't realize that this is a challenge or an issue that you have within the process unless you do 
a formal type of after action or a post submission type of debrief. Everybody wants to hear about that. Um, so, you know, it's all the stuff that happens in the middle that they don't really want to be, you know, troubled with. Um, but I think you're doing yourself a disjustice if you don't take the time to really kind of, you know, get feedback. And it could be feedback, you know, um, definitely get feedback when things go well. I, I know that um, we all want to know why something happened when it went when it went sideways, um, but we really don't take the same amount of time and effort for when it went well, because when things go well, we want to do more of that. Um, and so, you know, and then also kind of encourage and also um, I, I find that, uh, you know, people who have spent three or four really long weeks, weekends and, and things like that on, on an opportunity, um, some of us do it day in, day out. It's nice to hear um, kudos, right? Good job. Like this went really well. This went exactly how it went, you know, was supposed to go. Um, you know, this would have been better if we maybe made this tweak. Um, strategies for um, gaining a competitive edge. So um, differentiation of value proposition. Um, it's, this is part of like the, the, the bid decision is, you know, can you really clearly differentiate yourself and do you have a value proposition? And, and, and sometimes um, you really can't. And so I think you need to be really realistic about this. I think companies really kind of struggle to be like, oh, we have to be different or, you know, whatever. It's it's okay that you, you're not different because I don't think a lot of opportunities are differentiating type of, you know, opportunities, but at least understand what your value proposition is, is that that's a, first and foremost, um, is you can't make the case for why us, why you, um, or why you vices your competitors if you don't really kind of understand that. And so um, what really kind of goes into being able to create a really good value proposition is to understand the customer needs. And so do you understand what the customer need? Do you understand what is required in this opportunity? Do you understand how to really kind of engage and tailor some of your approaches and your solutions um, to the customer? And, and so some of that kind of goes back, I, I know, you know, this is, we're talking about bid decisions and not proposals, but if you can kind of see here is that a lot of the questions and the, um, the, the things that we're asking and, and solving here on the front end really impacts the back end, which is the proposal side, is that you need to be able to kind of feed proposals some of this really good information on why you, why us, and why and what the customer needs, and what are some of their hot buttons you know, regarding that. And so this all needs to be gathered prior to the, the proposal part. Um, and have we developed a strong partnership um, going into this? Um, and, and partnerships can kind of look differently, right? It, it might be, you know, do you have to strategically hire? You know, do you need to bring in other technologies or other companies who have um, complementary services and, and skills uh, on, on this bid? Um, who would be a good industry partner to kind of bring in and enhance your capabilities so that you can be competitive? Um, and you know, sometimes it's people, sometimes it's a process, other times it might be, um, you know, technologies. Um, but can you kind of adapt to that? You know, some opportunities might require you to be and adopt, um, be more agile and adopt new technologies. And so it doesn't really apply to everything, um, but that is something that you need to kind of really consider is, you know, like as you develop, you know, your bid decision process and, you know, the, the questions that you ask, um, and, and whatnot, um, that might be something that you have to kind of consider. Is this technology something that we're not familiar with or can we team with someone you know, who, who does? Um, and then branding and reputation is, is really important. Um, if you look at some of the companies that are really successful in this industry, there are companies that are really good with brand. Um, they have a very strong brand. Branding and reputation is paramount. Um, it determines whether or not people are, and teams are going to want to team with you. It's also going to determine whether or not you know um, a company or an organization is going to be evaluated you know favorably uh, you know from the end customer's perspective. So um, again, all of this is really something that is important um, that you need to kind of consider you know in order for you to really be competitive. And so um, a, a couple key takeaways here, um, I think it's you need to make your decisions from a very strategic perspective. 
Um, I, I think when you have a formal bid no bid process, when it's documented, it keeps you clear, it keeps you focused, it makes you more efficient, um, and it keeps you aligned with what your core goals and capabilities are. Um, being really comprehensive, right? Don't just do it to check the box. Don't just do it just because that's what you know industry expects from you or your executive expects. Really understand, you know, like, um, and and take take time and consideration into developing how you do it. I think it's really important that we explain um, when we're doing something, uh, why we're doing it, and then focusing on being really good and uh, disciplined in how we do this process um, and, and what you're looking for as far as like the outcome. So um, again, this, this will look slightly different depending upon the opportunity, the size, the complexity and the size of your own organization. Um, and then continually enhancing and um, improving um, the process. Uh, this is a this is an industry where we're constantly evolving. We're constantly improving. There's technology. Um, I you notice that I didn't mention or talk about AI, um, and so I know that it's kind of overhyped and you know um, discussed. And there's two camps, the the for and against. And there are some of us like myself who are kind of like bridging, like right in the middle. Um, it's not going to be the death of our industry. I think it's going to definitely help in our industry. Um, but you need to understand how to use it. So like I tell my 14 year old, um, use Google for good. And so um, now I'm telling my clients use AI for good, right? Know how to use it, know how to integrate it um, and, and know what the limitations are obviously um, and, and what it can do. Um, but it can definitely you know, help to kind of improve um, your process and maybe kind of um, help you along the ways in, in making some of these decisions. And this is my contact information um, for you to get a hold of me. So I guess at this point here, um, Chloe, I guess we can go ahead and take questions. Absolutely. So I do see a few on my end, so I'll just kind of read them off for okay. everybody. Um, so the first question we have is from Dale. Um, and Dale says, for those of us working with small businesses, it can often be like pulling teeth to get leadership to even conceive of strategic objectives of the organization, but it's so difficult to target without a target. As a professional psychologist and philosopher, LOL, um, do you have any advice on how to elicit strategic objectives from leadership in a way that helps them open up and not close off? Thanks, Dale, for that really hard question. <laughs> straight out the gate. Um, you know, that's, that's a tough question because I think sometimes it, it's it's kind of like it, it all depends, right? I think some leaders are really impacted by the bottom line, the almighty dollar. And so if that is something that is, um, you know, that they value or that they're really concerned about, um, you know, I will try to uh, communicate that, um, you know, if you don't uh, provide enough input, if you don't provide enough guidance, your staff are going to continue to kind of bid, source, and identify opportunities that are are not money makers for you, and you're wasting time. And so, there's a lot of time and effort that I don't think people realize in going to identifying and qualifying an opportunity. Like this process does not take place overnight. It's like peeling back an onion. You know, I, I'm like I kind of think back about Shrek's, right? You know, like like ogres are like onions. Opportunities are like onions. You peel back one layer, you've got another one and it makes you cry a little bit. You peel back another layer, you discover something else and it makes you cry a little bit. Um, and so, you know, like doing, you know, evaluating opportunities is expensive. Um, it can be expensive not only in the process part of it too, but it can be expensive if you bid the wrong opportunity. And so a lot of times we get asked to come in and evaluate why they didn't win a certain bid. You know, maybe they're on a losing streak or they've submitted a couple bids with the same customer and they've lost several times. They always wanna try to blame proposals. They always try to wanna try to blame, you know, like what did we not do right? What did we not write right? Was it our graphics? Was it whatever? And at the end of the day, the majority of times, it's not that proposals did anything wrong. It was because they didn't qualify the right opportunities or they didn't take the time and effort to really evaluate, should we really be bidding this? 
And sometimes executives will pressure staff to bid opportunities because there's ego in it, um, there's FOMO behind it. Um, and so you, I think sometimes consultants are a little bit more effective than maybe sometimes internal, you know, uh, leaders are in getting an executive to say, okay, fine, I understand. No, we're not going to bid that. Um, but you really need to listen to your people, you know, like these, these highly seasoned, you know, BD capture people are there for a reason. They're there to kind of advise, but at the end, but at the same time too, and I just, um, did a, a coaching session with a proposal director is that proposals needs to also push back too. You need to have your proposal people be part of the bid evaluation process in that proposals know where all the bodies are buried. They know whether or not you're qualified for this opportunity. They know whether or not you've got the staff for it. I think, you know, sometimes, you know, proposal people know more about an organization than their BD capture people. And so, it's really incumbent upon proposal directors in, in general to kind of push back and ask the really hard questions. Why are we bidding this? If we bid this, what is our strategy? How are we gonna do this? What past performances, what key personnel, you know, like how are we going to address some of these requirements? Um, because at the end of the day, you're gonna be the person who's gonna have to actually make it happen. So, um, you know, if you're gonna be responsible for it, you might as well have a seat at that table. So. Um, I think sometimes bringing it back to the bottom line and the cost to doing business, um, it can be very costly if you bid the wrong bid. Next question we have is from Krom. What is the best strategy and tactics to follow to make sure the bid no bid decision process has, has been made properly in terms of the business? Um, properly. Uh, you know, I think what, how to approach that would be to have an owner of that process. I think sometimes we introduce a process or introduce like a checklist or a tool and then say, here, everyone, you use it, you do this, you know, like somehow everyone's supposed to understand the process. You need to have an owner of it. So does it make sense to have the chief strategy officer, the BD director, or the capture manager, whoever it is, someone needs to own that process. Someone needs to be able to um, help kind of facilitate um, the, the discussions and the process along. So um, a lot of times it kind of breaks down when no one owns it and everyone's supposed to be responsible for their own. Um, and then that way, you know, when, when things like that happen, then they kind of all try to put their own spin on it and, you know, make changes ad hoc and different things like that. And now you're evaluating things kind of ins inconsistently across the organization. So I think one owner um, to kind of help, you know, be the gatekeeper of all of that is, is helpful. And we have time for just one more question. Um, I know we have a few we're not going to be able to get to, but um, feel free to submit them throughout the survey after this session, or I'm sure you could contact Tan directly on LinkedIn or something sure. like that, and she'd be happy to answer. Um, but the last question is how to bid for a proposal if there's an incumbent already, as the agencies may choose the incumbent most of the times. No, I challenge that. Um, I've actually worked on a lot of bids where I've won against the incumbent. So um, I'm, if you've listened to my other webinars, I've named names. So I'm going to name uh, names on this one. But I've actually bid two incumbent contracts for two large bidders um, where they've been in there for at least 10 years and I've won. I've beaten them on their technical. I've beaten them on the management, their staffing. And I should never have beaten them on their staffing um, and their key personnel resumes. So. Um, you can beat incumbents and no agencies don't always choose the same incumbent um I, I think more and more agencies are not choosing the incumbents more incumbents are losing um, their bids because they recognize the fact that sometimes the incumbents are lazy um, and so it kind of goes back to you you know um being uh really strategic and planning for um for these bids every incumbent is beatable um and that's why a lot of times i get brought in is because i know how to beat the incumbent um, and, and again, it's the same strategy that you should have when you are the incumbent is, you know, we talk about incumbentitis that is real. Um, it's not a myth. Um, it is something that everyone kind of, you know, suffers from. Um, and I think sometimes incumbents are a little, um, they're a little blinded 
um, to, to maybe where and how they can improve um, or where they're vulnerable. Um, and, and so, you know, doing the same thing just for, you know, the, the same sake um, is easy for some customers. So I think you have to understand that customer too. You know, some customers are very risk averse, um, but um, they can be beaten. I think it all kind of depends on the situation and the program, the complexity at hand. Um, and, and here's the thing too, if they can't be beat, why shouldn't you be part of their team? And Ton, do you have any final parting words, any last thoughts? Um, you know, I, I think I talk about bid decisions a lot. <laughs> And I always kind of, you know, like I, I try to put a new spin on it, you know, each time just because it's it's one of those over discussed topic topic. Um, but um, I, I kind of look at business decisions as kind of a little bit of like mental chess. And um, it's it involves people at the end of the day. And so um, I would say that um, I think we need to talk about the process internally more. We always need to incorporate and bring different people and more people into that process. And I'm not advocating having, you know, like a, a BD meeting with like 50 people in the room from, you know, like all your business areas and your, your PMs. But at some stage, you do need to kind of bring people in from different parts in your organization because you need to hear different voices. And if you're hearing the same voices every single time, then you're getting a very jaded, you know, very, um, very distorted view on whether or not you should bid an opportunity, so. Well, wonderful. Um, thank you, Ton, for taking the time to share this wonderful presentation with us today and sharing your expertise. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. I am very sorry about the technical difficulties sorry. we had for a Bye -bye. few moments. It happens. Um, both the slides and the recording of this webinar will be available soon on our website on demand. Don't forget that part two of this series continues tomorrow at 11 o'clock in the morning with Fred Vilcek, Senior Proposal Manager at Khaki. Um, once this webinar ends, there is a survey on your screen. Please fill it out. I love to get your feedback. I do read all of the feedback. Um, and thanks, everybody. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their days. Thanks, all. Bye.